Um, hi, good evening. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of uh, seconds to get settled uh, for the talk back. Just a few seconds. All right. Um, hi, I'm Julie Listengarten, Artistic Director of Theatre UCF. Uh, tonight, I will co-moderate uh, our talk back with Joni Newman. Joni is a second year MFA student in the Theatre for Young Audiences program. Uh, she was also the dramaturg uh, on this production of How to Catch Creation and worked collaboratively with the cast and creative team. We hope you enjoyed tonight's performance. It's a third virtual reading in the series Amplify, Empower, Illuminate, Four Plays, Many Diverse Voices. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our panel for tonight's talk back. Uh, we have uh, the cast members and our creative team with us tonight. Uh, in just a moment, Joni uh, will lead a guided discussion with the panelists about the play and production process. In the meantime, we are inviting you to share your thoughts and observations in the chat, starting with the phrase, it made me think. The panelists will be able to see your observations and uh, may integrate them in, in their responses. Following the guided conversation with the panelists, we'll, we will open the discussion for questions from you. Uh, if you'd like to submit a question, click on the Q&A and type your question. Please remember that questions to the panelists should be submitted in the Q&A section. You can see the questions posted by others and you have an option to upload the question if you would like to hear the answer. Please remember to keep all questions and comments respectful and on topic. This talk back has been recorded and the link will be posted on the Theater UCF web page uh, very shortly. Thank you. Joni, now it's, it's your turn. All right, uh, we're still waiting on our director. So there are a couple of questions that I wanted him to be here for. So we might jump to the bottom of the list of questions I sent you all, is that okay? <laughs> So let's start with the question, and this can be for anyone on the panel. Oh, hi, yo. We'll start with anyone on the panel who wants to contribute. And if you just want to like wave or just start speaking, we'll we'll go with this together as we work with Zoom. But how has working on this play now impacted your artistry? As individuals. Janice. Okay, hi. Um, for me personally, this was the first time that I was able to, from a technical standpoint, analyze my character. So whereas before I would have just jumped right into the character without kind of doing any background research, this was the first show that I thought needed to take, that I needed to take the time to really develop and analyze. And I'm glad I did because I got to learn a lot about Riley and where she was coming from. So that was a big step for me in my artistry. Good. Yeah, Mac. I definitely like to piggyback on that in a sense of, actually, mine's a little bit opposite because I've always been known for being very technical, but this was a chance for me to actually just live in it because I found myself really similar to Stokes in the sense of, I know that there was a period for me that I just felt very just off. Like I was like, I feel like my artist, she was like dry and I was looking for anything to find a sense of like, that spark, that need to create, but it was happening until one day there was. And definitely doing the show helped me with that. That was my personal spark. And within it, I was learning aspects about myself that even Stoke, in just learning about the trials and tribulations that even Stokes was going through that was similar to my own, to a sense where he and I was just one person. Like there was never a separation of any of the two. So I felt like when I did those, these readings, in general, as an artist, it helped me to teach myself just to live, live in the moment, keep living in that moment and see and write it out and see what happens next. So that's something that helped me out. I'm so glad you had that experience. It's such a, a gift as an actor when you have that opportunity to relate so well to a character and just have the chance to breathe in it. So I'm glad that you had that experience. Anything you wanna add, Timothy? Um, I would say for me, the way that I had to look at Griffin and how the many avenues he had to take to try to create what he wanted to create, it wasn't really a moment to where he never really stopped 
trying. He tried everything. He tried it from surrogacy to adoption. He never really just stopped trying, looking for every single other avenue. And I related to that because in trying to create other things and like acting or trying to trying to draw or just anything that involves creation, there are so many avenues that we have to take and so many things that get in the way of that. We shouldn't allow those things to not let us try everything. Just try everything to get to the, that to that one specific creation that we want. Yeah, Griffin's dogged determination to go after any avenue to get what he wants is so inspiring to me as well, especially right now where there do seem to be a lot of obstacles um, to creation. Um, Tom and Morgan, as technicians on the play, anything you wanna add at all? I'm kind of throwing you on the spot here, but I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> no, you're good. I was actually planning on saying something. Um, I think this play has really helped me like think outside of a box uh, for stage management, uh, just because we're trained with traditional theater of like calling a, sh like for me calling a show with like a physical stage. And so now like calling it from a Zoom like meeting um, was very interesting and helped me like become more digital and think outside of a like physical sense, if that makes sense. And to piggyback off of her, I feel like it also made me very much think outside of the box of even trying to figure out how to communicate with people um, because we are just in this tiny little space, but we need to communicate with everyone, make sure everyone gets everything they need to know and all that kind of jazz. So it was very much like, how does one work in a digital space and yet still be a live kind of environment and feeling if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yo, as director, how did that impact you? Well, you know, as in the way of artistry, I, I really think, you know, us folks in the theater, we, um, we, we like to construct problems to solve or try to solve. <laughs> and, um, and I think we've really constructed a really unique problem um, with uh, trying to do this, uh, attempting to, to take uh, this thing that's made for the stage, do it as a reading, virtually on zoom with these other aspects you know and i think i think that that is kind of the heart of what artist does is that we take the, the we take the raw materials that we've been given and we try to construct something meaningful that will move our hearts you know and um and it's not only about the construction it's also about the process of construction how how do we go about creating spaces um, that are maybe less hierarchical, um, spaces where we can share the, the weight. And I think that's what I'm learning more as a director is, is how, how do we let go of control? How do we surrender to a process? Um, there's so many things we can fight for. And I think this applies to life as well as the, as the stage that I'm learning to, as an artist to, to, to let go, trust my, my actors more, trust, trust the the kind of structures around theater and I think it's in this surrender that we find something quite rich um again both in life and on the stage and so that that would be the point that that's where I feel that I am as an artist now and how this how this process has challenged me yeah I've I've, I've heard from from each of you and from other actors in this process that that it really does challenge us to kind of strip away what why we do what we do a little bit and really hone in on what matters most to us as artists. So, so thank you all for sharing. And I think that's a great segue into this next question that I have for you. Um, Yo, you're really familiar with this one because we talked about it for a, a long time before this show even started, which is dissecting the title um, of this play, How to Catch Creation. And we talked specifically about the words catch and create. Um, Throughout this play, there are many, many different forms of creation that the different characters undergo. They try um, to create humans. They try to create written words, visual arts, music, relationships with each other, with themselves, with the future, with the past. Um, so there are lots of struggles that people face with creation. Yo, talk a little bit about how that title inspired you um, and the element of creation as we drove into this process. Well, you know, Joni and I, you and I, we talked about like kind of had a little bit of a, a nerd out moment around etymology and like the meanings of names. And so, so yes, this became a kind of a core, core aspect 
um, in kind of, you know, parsing out what is this play about? And I, you know, I mean, you, I mean, I, there are other, I mean, there are other words too, right? There's, there's how to. And so there's a question first is, is the playwright trying to teach us something? Is this a, an instruction manual that she'll give us answers or are we left with more questions? And I, and again, I, 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 I this is in my spirit a lot, James Baldwin, that the, the purpose of art is, is to, is to uncover the, the, the questions hidden by the answers. And so I think this how to is important as well. Catch, we talked about, you know, we talked about uh, what does it mean to, to catch or be caught, to be incarcerated? Um, what does it mean to, to feel like one has to settle into a relationship because of the birth of a child or because of the absence of a child, what have you? I mean, um, uh, what does it mean for, you know, um, to, for one to feel contained in districts um, or moved um, through through gentrification, like all these rich questions are alive in these in the play, right? The the, the time periods kind of allude to that. That there is there is something about incarceration. There's something about um, about geographical locations where where um, protests and and then sometimes rioting comes because people feel contained either in an economic space or in a geographical space or or in the space of non-human or not human enough and um, and or or second class citizen, right? These are all spaces which by which we oftentimes feel contained. And I think that that, that catch um, kind of is elude, eludes that. And then of course creation. I always have to go um, to this idea, um, this maybe Judeo Christian idea, this Abrahamic tradition of the Creator and being made in the image and likeness of a God, whoever she or they may be, and that we are, are, are in this life to, to, there's something in this, our lives that we are here to create. We are here to kind of follow in, this, in the footsteps of something bigger um, than ourselves, or maybe even something quantum or smaller than we are. And so I think, I think these began to ask us, this ask us, you know, are we constructing the lives we want? And, um, and, and are there structures around us that are maybe keeping us, or help make, make us, make, make it a little harder for some people to uh, or maybe a lot harder for some people to uh, to to catch creation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was that was definitely something we talked about. The idea that creation is something that that floods throughout all of these characters' lives in one form or another. Um, and we we did definitely de determine or talk a lot about the idea of whether or not the catching of that creation is a positive thing or a negative thing. Um, uh, we used synonyms for catch, like capture, incarcerate, clamp, snatch, grab, seize, pluck. Is it a muse or is it something that's jailed? Um, so what do you all think after living in this play for a while? Is creation something that can be caught or should it be caught? McKinley. I feel like creation is something that can never be caught. It's something that manifests, is purely manif like manifestation because when I think of the word catch, like you said, it's incarceration, it's capture, it's being grabbed. I feel like it's a strip away of freedom, whereas creation gives you freedom. It gives you liberty. It gives you a sense of direction and guide and guidance in a sense. It really does transcend beyond just one thing. And none of that, even if it's like maybe reading a script or for me, sometimes music and dance, like we're creating, like you're creating a story, you're creating of making a statement, I feel like creation is something that really just speaks to like just humanity. Like what's going on in, inside yourself and really, what is the message you want to leave to this world? What you want to give back? And but yeah, that's basically what I feel like creation is, honestly. You told me you had a good answer for that question before we started and you were right. I like that. <laughs> it, it reminded it me of the idea of if we come at this from the perspective that Yo talks about with that Judeo-Christian idea of all of us being a product of creation, that how to catch creation, a lot of it has to deal with the trying that these characters have in catching each other. Um, what was that like for you as actors to live in these kind of relationships where they, what did they teach you? I don't think I want to go for it. <laughs> Or should I continue on? Yeah, go for I it. Feel like, 
I feel like, what was the question again? How was it with the character? <laughs> So make sure I was right. <laughs> you're asking me to rephrase my own thoughts. That's rude. Yes, no. <laughs> sorry. No, you're fine. How did, um, what did you learn about the idea of, of relationships? If we're talking about how to catch creation and the creation that's being caught is a human, what does this, what does this play teach us about relationships and what makes them uplifting and helpful to each other or what makes them restrictive? I think, and I'm speaking for the, the relationship of Stokes, I feel like he had this preconceived mindset of what he think Riley should have been, which was in a way, as I felt it, kind of like you're like almost submissive in a sense. And Riley was just not that woman. She really is her own free spirit. I mean, yes, she's very supportive of him. Yes. But however, he leaned, like it's funny, he even said in the script actually where, or somewhere in his conversation with Griffin was like, I never really made a decision on my own. I always had a woman telling me what to do. He clinged to her so much that almost it was a crutch. Instead of really trans being his own person, really going after what he wants. It wasn't, and the only time he ever went, really went after what he wants was until he actually said, I wanna write this novel and I'm doing it for my own personal reasons. And I think what I learned, especially for myself in my own life is that love should be something that, or even relationships should be something that you're supposed to support one another you may not agree on everything, but you, you should be able to understand another person's perspective and where they're coming from. And it was until the end where Riley even made her stand and saying, no, this is what I feel, this is what's going on, that he finally saw what was going on, in, in my personal opinion. Yeah, Jenny, go ahead. I think Riley was given the opportunity to experience both creation in in the more negative aspect and the positive so I, I feel like with the negative while it started really well with Stokes the she and Stokes you know it was an amicable relationship and whatnot I believe that Riley's main objective in this whole show was to kind of find her own passion so so what with what Tammy said you know you you hide your passion in someone else's that really resonated with me and I, I began to question well why you know and I think that the pressures to be a you know a woman supportive for your man with your man by your man can be exhausting at times and when you feel like you're putting your passion and your desires on the back burner to support him that can be exhausting and can be tasking so i think that when riley met tammy and got to know tammy that was her that was her opportunity to to come back into herself and to be a little selfish you know, to put herself first, to, to, to blossom, her, to have her passion blossom. And so I think that with both, with both, with Riley's character and her relationship with both Tammy and Stokes, we were able to see how creation can be freeing and also detrimental to the character, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Because at first glance, you could look at this set of characters and think, oh, Riley's the one that doesn't create anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than like a baby, but like she's, she's, but, but that was kind of, that wasn't an active choice that she made. It happened. Right. And so, but I, but that's not true about Riley. She's also a creator. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. All right. I want to, Timothy, do you have anything you want to add before we move on to our last part of this? Um, you don't have to. I would like to answer, but is it possible that I can still think on it till the very end? Absolutely. We'll come back to you. All right, so before we move on to kind of the next section of this talk back, um, one last question that I wanna ask before we switch over to Julia is, what do you th think the message of this play is um, or suggests for black or queer artists, especially now? What do you hope that the message is about being black and queer in America? I think it's that it's the truth is the fact that we are all complex individuals that you're not going to meet any black artist or black queer artist that's just one dimensional it's impossible we're always three dimensional at all costs at all times and i think it's also through this i can't help but feel this sense of liberation like yes i am this three-dimensional person i want to be this person because it's not a, a curse it's an actual kit I see it as a gift from God, personally. And so 
I feel like that's really the message is it's like living your truth, always living your truth at all times, because the moment you start living for someone else or not manifesting to your true self, that's where the problems begin. And that's where like artistry begins to die because if you can't live in your truth, because the, the arts force you to be truthful about who you are, who you are as a person. And if you can't do that, then that you, you can't create. You have, you can always have this mental block that's a part of you forever. So I think that's what the play, or for me, that's what the play taught me in a sense. Yeah. And that's a very real part of Stokes's journey is the idea that until he feels comfortable pursuing what he is passionate about, he's stuck. We see that with Tammy as well, right? Absolutely. And especially like, finally you saw, and you, I feel like this whole three-dimensional side of Stokes was a sense of like, I thought I was only going to be this painter and that was it. And you said it himself, like I was trying to find something within my father, see myself through him, like a sense of identity, but I didn't get that. Something was lost. And it was until he started writing the book and going through the same journey that GK even went through. The sense of, oh, this is actually my true passion. This is what I want to do. And now I'm really finding aspects of myself that makes me who I truly am. So I think that's something that's beautiful about this play. Yeah, I agree. I learned a lot from that too. Any other comments? Yo. Was that Yo first or Janice first? Oh, whichever. Go Janice, you wanna go? I was gonna, I agree completely with McKinley, what he had to say. And I think in addition to that, I think this is a story reminding black queer artists to not let fear stop you in this world where you are told no, where you are scared and you are, you I mean, you turn on the news and there's just all kinds of craziness going on. It can be very crippling. So I think with a, with a show like this, we can learn and be, make it become a habit to, to not let fear stop us and to create freely. Go ahead, Yo. Mm, that's beautiful, guys. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just about to get married next year, uh, next, sorry, next month. <laughs> um, and there is a big question about, you know, having children. And um, I'm like, I'm what, I'm 30, 35. I'm going to try to go to a PhD. I'll come out at 40. I know, I know Julia had her, had a child while she was in her PhD doing her dissertation. Um, but there's something about the, like, that the, like, queer, uh, many, not queer bodies, but maybe like, you know, like homosexual bodies that, um, that it's like, there's, it feels like there's this kind of a sterility, right? Like, <laughs> this, like, how do I have a kid? How, and there are options and there is an intentionality in having that child for us that it may be a little different than, and I think that's some of Griffin's frustration, even though he's, he's, he's a straight guy in the play. I mean, at least we, we, we think he is, right? That, um, and and uh, he struggles with this with Riley and he's like, oh, uh, they're, Riley and they're just having, you're having kids and you know, blah, blah, do they even care? It's, you know, they're gonna, and it's like, I want to have a child. I'm ready. Like that's how the play opens and that's how the play ends. And so I think there's something about like, what are we trying to create? And I think at the end of the day, we're trying to create, I think the play is telling us we're trying to create relationships, that that is the fundamental principle of the universe, that there is that thing over there and that thing over there. And there, there is a relationship between them and what the tension is, the, the tension dynamic or how that's broken or or how it's made again remade again is is what makes the world go round you know and um and so there's something about about that about this can i can i have a child do i need to be in a particular relationship to have a child is the you know and, and what all what all goes into to, to making a child but that also that creation is more than just procreation that there is there is there is I can create this play and, it, and I can, I can have this relationship, this friendship, and it'd be really close. Or I got this lover or, I mean, what, like, and I can have this life that I create this relationship with myself and my art and what I'm making. So I, I think there's something quite rich about that. Um, again, not necessarily giving a full answer, but like more questions, you know? So oh, for um, sure. I'll leave that, I'll leave that there. No. And I don't think the play seeks to answer all questions. I think it seeks to raise them. Timothy. 
what I learned from this play is that let creation give you happiness, no matter who tries to stop that, no matter who you are as a person, create to create to be happy. And I, and, and the one thing that hit me on that was when Tammy, when, when she started talking about that, I haven't been painting. And then when I was, and then when I was with Riley, I started to paint again, that, that twisted in my mind of where it's like basically where we create something, but we feel like it may not be worthy. We feel like it may not even, you know, have a chance at anything, but your creation should just give you happiness because you created that, you made that, you did this. And just from just from reading this play and learning that, it just kept me wanting to, it just kept me wanting to keep doing what I wanted to do, like as an artist, as just a person, just wanting me just to feel happiness, just keep being happy no matter the circumstances. Thank you for that. I feel like I needed to hear that tonight. So thank me, you. me too. <laughs> That was that was good. Um, I I absolutely love that the the dynamic of this group. It's been such a joy to work with all of you. I've learned so much. Um, Julia, why don't you take us into the next section of our talk back? Well, thank you so much. That was incredible. Your your insight was really amazing um, to hear about your process and and and. Um, how you approached your characters and how the process impacted um, your ideas about so many things, right? You know, there's, it's such a rich play. It's about identity, it's about creative process, it's about human relationship, really. Um, so thank you so much for, for your thoughts. We have a few questions from the audience. Um, so Jim Brown asked a question uh, to the cast. Uh, who were your inspirations that helped you connect to your character? Uh, a friend, a family member, a person in current events, or a historical figure? So it's to the cast, but it can be really to, you know, Johan, if you'd like to uh, answer that question as well. Um, so who would like to, who, who would like to address that? Who would like to start? I can take it. I can answer that. Um, so I got, I got my inspiration from a few people in different avenues. So with the character herself, I didn't necessarily have, you know, the, a black homosexual, you know, person, but I was able to take different aspects of that. So actually, um, Ethel Waters, she inspired me um, just because she, you know, she's a black female artist and she, again, didn't let fear stop her from doing what she wanted to do. She was comfortable in her own skin. She was independent. She was smart and, and overall a great person to, to look up to. Um, acting wise with my facial expressions, my mother inspired me a lot because she and I share the same facial expressions. Um, so I was able to kind of bring everything that I've seen for the past 19 years to the stage. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> um, I would say for me with Griffin, the, the people that inspired me were my parents just because of how when Griffin is trying to create or trying to get a child that brought me back to my parents and basically with them um, they, when they were trying to have me at first, they like doctors kept telling them, like, you won't be able to have a child. And they tried every single type of avenue they could. And at one point they wanted to give up, but then just at the very, at the very bottom, there was like, no, just, and, uh, and since, and since we're in a religious family, they decided just like to give, pray to God and just let God work it out. And lo and behold, I'm here. So with that, when when I was looking good, I just kept going back to how my parents had to go through almost like in the exact same situations where they just had to keep trying every single avenue they could and trying just to have me. And in looking at that, I just used that inspiration and in trying to make sure, okay, I want to try every avenue I can. I, I, I can't give up on trying to get a child. I just can't. And that's what mostly inspired me. 
I'll piggyback off that too, because the same thing happened for me. I felt like one of them was actually my father, it was definitely an influence in a sense of, I saw someone who originally wanted to be an artist, but sadly didn't manifest that dream at all. He didn't get the chance, he didn't get that opportunity, because originally he wanted to be like a, a musician, but then life happened, he came to America, and sadly every avenue was like, just shut. He didn't get that opportunity. So in a sense, when I saw Stokes in this rut, I saw kind of like my father, my dad in the sense of like, you kind of see just like the sadness, the somberness of like, oh, I'm trying to get, get somewhere, but I know I can't do that, sadly. And I also looked at, I think another inspiration was I saw was my own castmates, just all of us as black artists, as a conglomerate that I bet we all have stories of, of a time where someone's told us no. Essentially, they told us no in an art form that we love so much. And we took, we done whatever it took to be where we are as we stand. I know more personally for me, I've been working, working hard just to try to get to be a musical theater major for almost six years. This is my sixth and final year, finally just trying to get this degree. And there were so many no's until I got that one yes, just to do what I love and just try to get here. So I felt like that was like a motivation that kicked in, especially when I see Stokes in a sense of he's an artist who really wants to not only have that spark, but also be successful at what he does. And piggyback off of Timothy, when he says like, he just wants to be happy with his work. He doesn't want to feel so saddened or feel like to have this block anymore. He wants to see his work flourish and just grow as a human being will want to. So I feel like that's my inspiration for that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I have a few questions uh, from Sammy Pantella. Um, first question is for Timothy. Uh, as someone who also tends to play older, especially in educational theater, what did you discover about playing Griffin right now and who is quite a bit older than you? What I discovered about playing Griffin is just to always keep learning, no matter how old you are, just keep on trucking and learning and uh, there's so many th things to think about with him i also learned just to never stop just <laughs> man yeah such an amazing griffin is just ah oh, so, so much about him Right. And, and as you said, that that how he sort of continues to pursue, right, despite all the struggles that he's endured. Um, uh, another question from Sammy, uh, the whole cast, but especially Janice, uh, so it's a question for, for everyone, really, but you know, if Janice wants to start, uh, what was it like performing some incredibly intimate scenes in this distance or distancing setting? Um, it was interesting. It was very interesting because the way I had my camera set up was it was literally above here and the Zoom session was going on to the side. So I was literally looking at the camera at these most intense scenes. So it was a little challenging. Um, but I, I think that if I just listened to what was being said and if that, if that resonated with me it was a bit easier um i don't know i'm sure if we were on a physical stage it might have been a little bit more easy um and but but for the things that we were given for the time that we were given i think it was really i think we pulled it off pretty well honestly so hopefully we did we'll see but it was a little challenging, but I hope it, I hope it came through. Yes, absolutely you did. <laughs> um, anyone else would like to uh, uh, talk about this, the sort of a very intimate, uh, intimate settings uh, in this socially, socially distancing venue? I would say that with doing intimate scenes, especially with how we're doing it now, which is, you know, computer and not doing it face to face, I still feel like the intimate scenes can still be done if we can just kind of try to feel the other person, 
feel what they're feeling, feel their emotions, feel just their physical being. For me, what I tried to do in the intimate scenes is that before I went into just every single rehearsal, I first sat down, took a giant breath, and then just try to imagine the person that is in my scene sitting in front of me or sitting beside me and try to feel that physical connection or just like that emotional connection between us. That was a fantastic point, actually. I'll take back on that, definitely. Where I would do the same thing, where like I was just, I would create this imaginary world, actually. Because, and the good thing we had those visuals and we saw what it would look like for the show. So I was able to kind of just build the world around me in my head. So I could just, I could just feel what the feeling was going to be like. And I know that for those really intimate scenes, at the same, same as Timmy, I would try to look at or just try to visualize where either he or even Janice would be at. And I also, it required me to really listen to their voices, just the tonalities, their shifts, their patterns, their rhythms, the tempo of how they're speaking to determine like what my next response would be like and how do I do that in the most genuine and on, honest way. It was definitely tough just given the fact that I was like, oh, I wish we were on stage and I was just feeling it. But at this, granted, I feel like we really did a good job. And I think we were able to just be our genuine selves through this entire thing. And also we had to learn, I had to learn the fact that this is no longer just stage. We're also doing somewhat film work too, given the fact that it is gonna be, it was a recorded performance. So that was also another thing that I had to learn how to be comfortable with. Um, thank you so much. And then the last question we have, um, well, actually two questions. The last two questions. Um, this, um, this question is for Johan, um, also from Sammy Pantello. How long were you able to sit with this play before moving into production? And what were some of the unique challenges that presented themselves when directing this play on Zoom? And whether, Johan, whether you have any advice to directors working in this new medium. <laughs> um, I know a lot, a lot of questions packed back in one question. No, it's, it's good. Um, Amy wants you to solve all the world's problems right now, but you can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Um, how long? Let's see. I, Julia, how, how long? <laughs> Time has just flown. Um, we, we started well, talking. I, I called you in June, maybe? June or July? We started chatting about that. Yeah, it feels like much longer than that, but that's that's true. It's June or July, and and fairly quickly we moved into pre-production, um, which I would say, um, I mean, generally on on a stage reading or even on you know our stage production, right? You're uh, one of the big um, task of the director is is working with their actors to kind of discover the topography or the uh, the blocking of the um, uh, of traffic on stage and so but in this medium we I worked instead of with the actors with that I worked with uh, our visual our visual designer and um, Tim uh, Brown right am I, I right Tim Brown um, uh, you think after I've seen his name on the Zoom on the Zoom title at the bottom, I, I know it back and forward. Um, we spent hours together um, on Zoom working out okay, where this person come in and this person goes up and and this goes out and and there's there's a whole construction there of of um, designing the um, the blocking before the actors are even in the space. So I say that's a big thing. That's quite quite different um, in this in this setting um, compared to to a stage production um i i just a, a bit for me as a director i'm i'm very um i'm very interested in fact in my and in, i'm interested in the inter the inner life and soul growth of all involved my myself and the actors the designers um everyone involved i'm really interested in like how do we grow our souls and so at the beginning of each of each of each meditation knowing that we're kind of in this these boxes and we're feeling isolated in this time of, of pandemic. Um, it's important that we that we center ourselves. And so I, I we have a meditation practice that we begin at the beginning of each, that we'd start at the beginning of each um, 
uh, rehearsal or sometimes, you know, when we got to the, the, the you know, read through where we center ourselves. And one of the comments or one of the things I, I try to emphasize is as I ask the actors, can we lean, lean back, lean back into all of our ancestors, bring them into the space with us. They are here. They are waiting. They are ready to support us in this work. And so in terms of this, how to catch creation, I'm really interested in, in us discovering that creation is already inside. And I think in, in this time where we're feeling so isolated in our productions and in our, our meetings and the Zoom meetings all day long and, 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 and not feeling together, there's something that this, this moment is teaching us. And that is, it's all inside, it's here. And that even when I'm working with an actor face-to-face -face or actress face-to-face -face on stage, that they're, that I'm actually reflecting my own soul, my own psyche back to me. And I can do that here because it's all in here already. I don't know if that, that makes sense, but for, so for me, as, as, as the director, I'm trying to facilitate a space where people feel held, even though we're miles apart. How can we, you know, how can we remain, hold a space, even though we're so scattered? And that was the big challenge, I think, as well. Um, is holding that space. And for me, it's centered with this internal awareness. Thank you, Johan. And then the last question uh, uh, to the cast, really. Um, what moment in a performance or the story your character was telling was the most impactful to you personally? McKinley? It's, I found it very ironic because the script answered the question for me. And it was the answer that Tammy gave to Riley when I talked about the portrait. And she said two words that brings me to this, to this day, let go, just let go. And at first when I heard that, I was kind of like, what do you mean by letting go? Like, what is letting go? I can't let go. But looking back, because I've always been this almost I look kind of cool collected, but I know I could be this highly tense, stressed up person just because I always felt like I had to be the person that was on the go and trying to rush to the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing to almost to a point where it's almost, it was a trained thought just to have this sense of like rush, but never really taking a step back to be like, whoa, whoa buddy, relax, calm down. You're doing too much. You're thinking too much. You're not letting your mind process what's going on. Allow yourself to actually just black, just to calm down. And I feel like now I'm finally in a state where actually, especially after during this production, I never felt like I was rushing on anything. I actually felt like I was actually enjoying every second of the process. Cause it was really was like not as heightened stakes. Cause I've been in shows where I felt like the stakes were just completely high in a tone that's been set to a point where it becomes very unenjoyable when your stakes are high because you don't, you don't feel safe in it. Whereas there's this immediate welcome of, you know, there's a safe space, enjoy the process. You're, doing, you're already doing the work because you're loving, loving it anyway. I love your craft and just be free within it. And I feel like that was a, a thing that I've learned really personally. And I translated it now to my score because now I don't feel like I'm rushing anymore in my schoolwork. I feel like I'm enjoying each moment. You know, I'm allowing myself to, I want myself to live, just live in that moment and just enjoy each process. Cause the moment you start rushing, you leave it behind. You might miss out on the most important, beautiful moments. So I feel like that's something I learned really well. Uh, anyone else would like to answer that, Johan? There was one moment in the play that I would say uh, got me, I think every time and that was, um, that is when Tammy is talking to Griffin about her experience of taking care of him when he was incarcerated. And she said, I was trapped. And um, I think, I think in this, I think there's something that this play teaches also is about like self-care and what does that mean? And even when the stakes are high for other people, like how do we, if I don't, if I don't have it here, I, I don't have it for, for my, for my team. I, if I don't have it here, if I haven't taken time to do that, you know, I don't have it for my cast and my friends and my family. Um, and so I, I think that that's a really powerful moment for me. Um, it's that Tammy moment. I was trapped. 
<laughs> you were in prison and I was trapped. Woo. Okay. Yay, great. Um, well, and this is, this is the last question for real, right? It appeared uh, suddenly, I think it was in the chat and then appeared in the Q and A. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's more technical. It's, you know, we are in the Zoom world right now and obviously there, there are challenges to um, create on Zoom for us right uh for, for theater professionals so this this question is about that so what what were some what were some challenges or biggest struggles uh for you during the process um uh, particularly uh, uh from a technical point of view and would you consider this performance venue in the future in a post-covid world uh or or are we all excited uh to to get back on stage uh or is it is it somewhere in between that we're learning how to create in a different way, perhaps uh, because of the current circumstances? Hmm. So maybe Johan. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, sign up sign up for academia or for my or my particular career because I wanted to do film per se. But I've had to do a master's uh, because of this COVID and do a film instead of a live production with my, you know, a solo film rather than work with my cast I'd hired here in Chicago. And um, and I what I what I long for right now is I long to be with these people that I've only been virtually with. Like I I I long for that. I long for that, Julia. I long to be in rooms with you, and and I, I long to meet you for real, Joni, and and uh, you know all all of you, you know Morgan, you know like being in the room, in the room, room where it happened, the room where it happened. I want to be in the room, y'all. So um, so I would say I would say no. I I I <laughs> there's some, there. I think some people will come up with something from this, and we'll take it. You know, maybe maybe take it on and then make something really interesting and unique for the future post COVID. But for me, I I would I want to be back on stage. That's that's where my heart is. That's where my love is. Um, and uh, and uh, and yeah, I think that's that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, Timothy. <laughs> I would say the hardest technical standpoint for me, at least, was trying to like set up my green screen then making sure my computer was like at that right angle to where the green screen wasn't like like hanging off to the side or you could see like you know not fully green screen and i was just like okay make sure, make sure my computer's set up make sure my light is set up make sure everything else is set up um and i would say my feet are literally dying to touch a stage they are dying to touch a stage i there was one time where i like went to the went uh, to the theater building to go grab my technical support. And literally I looked over to the black box and the first thing that popped in my head is, you know, you can go on there and go touch a stage, right? I'm like, I know, I know, I wanna do that so bad. I want to. <laughs> but yeah, I am very dying to touch a stage just to be in a room with everybody. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're ready, really. Uh, McKinley, I think uh, Janice wanted to say something earlier, right? So, uh, yes. Um, I'm not the most technologically savvy person ever. I'm sure Tim now knows that, Tim Brown knows that. Um, for me, it was very difficult. There would be nights where I was up until like one or two in the morning trying to figure out Zoom and I downloaded a bunch of stuff. Hopefully I don't have a virus. But that's beside the point. This was extremely difficult for me. This is it from the green screen. I didn't know if it was too wrinkly. I didn't know. I didn't know, y'all. I didn't know. So um, I'm not one to to say never will I do something. But I think I can positively say that I will never do this again. I don't think it's for me. Um, everyone has their gifts, but, but this this is not mine. So the physical stage is the is the stage for me. McKinley. I'm such a weirdo. I'm a half and half on this answer. Amazingly. I don't know why I shouldn't be, but I am because 
ironically, I feel like, I feel like because me, I'm an experimentalist. I can't help but be that way. And I feel like if you were to do this, we need to find a way to build a more personable aesthetic, like something that just sticks so well that theater could be done through a Zoom setting. At the same time, I'm like, yo, I'm also a humanitarian. I want to be around humans. You know, I want to be around just actual people, living people, and actually feel the rhythms, the shifts, and all that sorts. And on top of that, I'm hungry. I'm hungry to just be doing. I was. I can't help but think, what if the show was live? <laughs> the, the sh- it would have been totally different. I think so. Like, sure, if if I have to, I will have to do Zoom, but. I definitely want to be on stage though, or, or I'm biased too, or if it were to do TV and film, it would be still with humans, but we're actually using an actual camera on set, you know, so, because there it is. Yes. Um, thank you. So I think that's a really uh, great note uh, to finish uh, our talk back on. Um, I would like to thank you again for such a wonderful discussion. Um, and uh, uh, at the end, I'd like to offer a quote from uh, Christina Anderson, um, playwright. Um, quote, I feel black women specifically have a history of being erased in terms of their literary contributions in American literature. In a lot of ways, that's true for women of color in general. So I think the most important part is to keep these, vo- these women's voices alive and active and circulating, um, unquote. So I actually think I feel that these voices became alive and active and circulating in this production. And thank you so much for for that. Um, uh, And uh, yeah, uh, again, such a a wonderful show, um, wonderful talk back. Uh, Thank you, Joni, as well for uh, great questions. so please uh, come to our next show, uh, Kill Move Paradise by James Imes, directed by B. Boyd. It will premiere next Saturday, October 24th at 7 p.m. And we'll have a talk back with the creative team after the show. So I hope to see you there. Thank you and have a good night.